Welcome back to Case of the Sunday Scaries. I'm Elise. And I'm Annie. And guess what, guys? It is officially the holiday season. What's better, though? Holiday season or spooky season? Spooky, I think. Oh, okay. Why is this the hardest question I've ever been asked? (laughs) I do love spooky season, but here's where I think the holidays win. Spooky season has no really good food tied to it. Yes, you get candy, but I'm not a big candy person. And I don't like chocolate, so I'm not going to eat most of it. And I'm a little old for trick-or-treating, okay? (laughs) I have come to the realization I'm supposed to be the one handing out the candy, not the one eating it. But I love holiday food. Give me all the cheese boards. Give me all of the, like, decadent, yummy, warm food and the smells and the lights. Okay, food, smell, and light. I'm saying holiday season. I think you just convinced me the holiday season's better. (laughs) I was team spooky season because I feel like it's the entrance to the best part of the year, which is the holiday season. Halloween is like opening the door to what's to come. And after kind of a mild end of summer, yeah, there's like Labor Day thrown in there, but Halloween opens. But maybe that is, maybe I do like the holiday season because the food, unbeatable. Absolutely. And the holiday cheer, also unbeatable. You know? not someone that really buys into the whole holiday cheer thing. I think for a lot of people, the holidays in general are a really difficult time and a lot of memories of some painful memories, whether it's grief or whatever the case. But I don't think there's anyone that could disagree with me that when all the lights go up, especially if you live in a city and they light up the trees and you're walking around, that that's just, it's just pretty this time of year. I want Christmas lights. I get it. You're supposed to take your tree down by a certain time. But can we just keep the lights on the trees downtown? It looks so beautiful. I agree. They look so beautiful. Just like that warm comfort. There's something magical about good mood lighting. (laughs) Speaking of mood lighting, I am in the podcast studio today. Um, After you're hearing this episode next Sunday, hopefully we will be having video recording and some other fun things dropping where you can get exclusive content. So more to follow on that. But fingers crossed, guys, that soon, if you so desire, you can not only see our little faces, but you can follow along with what we're talking about with pictures and video and audio evidence right along with us here in the, whatever we decide to call it, podcast room. It was kind of sad because I made a whole PowerPoint for Delphi. I asked Annie because we did try to record here in the studio. That's when we realized that some of our equipment just wasn't compatible with each other. Annie and I are. We love each other, but our equipment was not loving yes. each other very much. I asked her, I said, Annie, can you send me over the pictures and stuff? And she goes, oh, yes, I have actually created an entire PowerPoint. And she sure did. So I was ready to be the person <laughs> with the clicker, clicking through the slides. So it's going to be really nice that if you so desire, like I said, you can watch us on YouTube, follow along. And so, you know, just as we're talking about it, you can see the pictures and decide for yourself about these cases. But with all of that said, for our last audio recording, I wanted to do this case. And of course, I had a whole other case planned, but I was in said podcast studio and was listening to Dateline. And this case happened to come up, I think they covered it years ago. And Something about it really struck me, not just the tragedy of the case, but because I'm fascinated by the human psyche, what makes us tick, this unbelievable case had me hooked because just when you think all hope is lost for getting closure, something unbelievable happens that proves the complexity of the human brain, its response to trauma. You know, everyone has their own personal way of dealing with it, but it's something that comes up pretty heavily in this case. And we're really going to talk about the mystery of regressed memories. I don't want to give too much away, so let's dive into the case of Bonnie Haim. Our story begins in Jacksonville, Florida. And if you are a true crime lover, you know some crazy stories come out of Florida. I mean, remember the guy eating a man's face? I don't know what's going on in the water down there. But please use a Brita filter because you don't want any of that in your life. Something weird is happening down there. (laughs) We start this case with a young woman named Bonnie. Bonnie Lynn Pesquito was born May 20th, 1969. And from every article I read about her, she was a great person. And it didn't sound like they were just romanticizing the idea of her after death, which 
of course, can happen. The best memories are the ones you tend to keep. Every single article, everyone that talked about her described her as social, loving, and an all-around great person with a very contagious laugh. When Bonnie was just 16 years old, she met Michael Haim. He was a few years older than her, but he was charming and described by all as very charismatic. So I'm sure Bonnie felt pretty lucky. You know, she's getting the attention of an older boy, which we said in the last case, I have uh, certainly been victim of that myself. You think, oh, they're so Same. cool, yeah. right? They're the guy in the upperclassmen hallway. But when Bonnie was only 18 years old, right after graduation from high school, she married Michael in the fall of 1987. Now, this is not back in the 60s where a very young marriage was something of, you know, commonplace. This is 1987. This is a very young marriage for that time. But Bonnie's parents loved Michael. So they were in full support of those two starting their lives together. Okay, so what can go wrong? This seems like the perfect fairy tale. Dun, dun, dun. We would be on a different podcast, Annie, if this was a perfect <laughs> fairy tale. The young couple began working for Bernie's Tool and Fastener, a construction supply company owned by Michael's Aunt Yvonne and his uncle Bernie. Bonnie was in charge of the account, so basically, while she didn't have a college degree at this point for accounting, she was acting as the accountant for this company. And Michael worked as a manager. Bonnie and Yvonne became very close friends. Yvonne even described her as her best friend. And it was clear that Bonnie truly shined in her role there. She was so friendly and kind to customers and had such a wonderful reputation with her employers, who again are basically her in-laws. It's her aunt and uncle-in-law. So as we know, in-law relationship dynamics can often be a little difficult and strained at times. Yeah. So it, it speaks <laughs> This speaks a lot about Bonnie, that not only did they get along, they were best friends. Only a year into their marriage, they welcomed a son named Aaron, and it seemed like this young couple was off to a great start. But as we know, no one knows the inner workings of a relationship beyond the two people in it. However, we do have a little window into their life together through a story from Yvonne, who again was their boss at the time. It is clear things were not going well between the couple. Yvonne remembers the couple arguing quite often, but one day in particular, it escalated to at least one physical altercation that she could remember clearly. Yvonne told Unsolved Mysteries in the episode about this case that one day they got into an argument. It was in the parking lot, and she came in crying because he had slammed her hand in the door and her nails were broken, and she was incredibly, very very upset at this point obviously that picture is just so painful to me like number one i think fighting is already hard but then to get physical and to have your fingers smashed and yvonne is probably in a really difficult position because she's the aunt of michael but the friend of bonnie not a place i'd want to be no and let's reverse that idea for a little bit just from limited experience in an abusive relationship they want to generally project that everything's fine, life is good, they're doing more behind closed doors, and he felt so emboldened, or maybe it wasn't even emboldened, maybe he was just caught in the heat of the moment of their argument, that he felt comfortable doing this in front of his family members. So obviously, his reputation to them is going to start to be questioned a little bit. It just kind of makes you wonder, you have to wonder, if he's comfortable doing that in front of his family members who are close with Bonnie and clearly would take her side in this, what's going on behind closed doors? I was just going to say that it was probably way worse behind closed doors. Yeah, you have to think, right? Or at least assume. So clearly things were escalating between the couple and Bonnie decided it was time to take action. In the later months of 1992, Bonnie was at her breaking point maybe because of what was happening behind closed doors, and knew it was time to leave Michael. I have to applaud Bonnie's efforts here because we know the most dangerous time in an abusive relationship is when you are trying to leave it. And I don't say that to deter anyone who's listening from leaving an abusive relationship. You absolutely deserve to leave. However, it's really important to have a safety plan put together that there's thought, and timing put into it to make sure that you, your pets, your kids, whoever's involved is safe. And she was doing this pretty much unbeknownst to Michael, putting this safety plan in 
into motion. Why is the most dangerous time this point of the the end of the relationship, her trying to get out? Yeah, I'm actually going to be covering this in an upcoming case and really diving into that dynamic. But to sum it up as quickly as possible, you have to think that abuse is not because, unless you're a sadist, abuse generally is not someone who is doing it because they enjoy hurting the other person. It's about control. So if Mm -hmm. that person who is, let's take out the word abuser, and just say, in control, the controller of the situation loses control of who he wants to be in control of, which at this time is his partner, things are going to escalate because that's what they're wanting, their attachment needs met. They're not doing it in a healthy way. They're doing it in an incredibly abusive way. But now that person is going farther and farther away from them. They're losing lack of financial control, potentially, physical control. Any type of control goes out the window when the person that you are doing this to is no longer in your presence. So that's when things can tend to escalate. But like I said, in a couple weeks, not only will I be covering a case about this as a very much a cautionary tale, but also sharing a little bit about my experience as well so that we can kind of dive into the dynamics of of that. And if you're a person in those relationships, how to get out as quickly and safely as possible. Bonnie knew if she was going to leave Michael, she was going to be a one-income household. So she secretly opened a checking account, one that was just in her name. I assume the fact that they kept harping on that, that maybe her and Michael had a joint account. So she opened one without him. She even went to the point in her safety plan to make sure that all of the statements from this bank account were sent to her work. Remember, guys, this is before online banking. So all of your statements came through mail. And Michael, who again worked with her, found out about this account. Whether he saw the bank statement or found out some other way, we're not sure. But what we are sure about is that this enraged Michael. Again, financial control is part of the abusive cycle because the less control they have, the less control they have of leaving, right? So the account was closed, I am sure, in order to subdue and pacify Michael, but that did not stop Bonnie's plans. She began giving money to one of her friends for safekeeping and quietly put a deposit down at an apartment and enrolled her son Aaron, only a little over three years old at this time, in preschool for the upcoming school year. In a Medium article, it was said she had saved around $1,250 secretively, which is a little less than $2,700 in today's money. Wow, inflation. That is impressive. Right. At first, you might go, well, that doesn't seem like a lot for a down payment and preschool and all of that. But remember, this isn't a matter of just months. She is just squirreling away this money because she is determined to leave. So that is an impressive amount in such a short amount of time. And I think what's also impressive is that she knows Michael was just watching her every move. So to pull that money out, to kind of save it away, I can't imagine how on edge she was. Like every time she went to drop off that money to her friend or pull that money out, like it just sounds like she was probably on fight or flight mode for those months. Absolutely. And you'll find out a little later that she did this secret little money. uh, I keep saying squirreling away, but that's kind of the image that goes in my head. You get your paycheck, you take $20 out of it. You know, you're kind of pulling from here and there, checking the couch cushions for change, like getting money any way you can where Michael's not going to notice it. And she did it pretty effectively because I don't think he was aware of this money that she had put aside. And we'll get into that a little later. Bonnie planned to leave him after the holiday season. Michael had a work trip coming up, which seems perfect for her plan. He's going to be away. She can pack her necessities, get her clothes and errands stuff and necessities all packed up. And by the time he comes home, she's already starting her new life with her son. However... And man, do I hate saying that word in this case. Everything was about to change on January 6, 1993. Bonnie had made plans to hang out with Yvonne after getting dinner for Aaron and, you know, just getting all the stuff that you do after work done. She was going to head over to Yvonne's and made plans for about 8 p.m. that evening. However, at 8.30, Yvonne's phone rang. It was Bonnie. She was clearly upset. Yvonne says that Bonnie was her best friend. I have those friends where they can call any time of the day and it's almost like you just have a sixth sense. They don't have to say more than hello and you're like, what's wrong? And you just know. I think that was the case here because Bonnie was upset. Yvonne is obviously on high alert. 
And Bonnie tells her that her and Michael had gotten into a fight, so she can't make it that evening. So Yvonne offered to come to her. What a great friend, right? You know, maybe if someone is around, it can de-escalate the situation. But Bonnie responded, no, I will be fine. Sadly, this would be the last time Yvonne would ever hear her niece-in-law and best friend's voice because the next day, when Bonnie didn't show up for work, things started going south. Michael also had called into work that day, telling another co-worker that Bonnie had left him the night before. They both still worked at the hardware store, correct? Yep. It was early that same morning when Yvonne's phone would ring again, but this time it was a police officer. I'm suspecting that this is happening well before 8 a.m., so she's probably up getting ready for work. She doesn't really know that Bonnie has called in, or excuse me, didn't call in, but she, at this point, it's not like Bonnie's a no-show. She's just going about her day. But things were going to change when that police officer who knew the young couple as well as Yvonne and Bernie asked her, where's Bonnie? We just found her purse in the dumpster at the Red Roof Inn. I think you need to get down here. Why do I feel like early morning calls from police and super late night calls are never a good thing? And this one, obviously, finding a purse in a dumpster does not look good. Yeah, all warning bells are probably going off. She got to skip her espresso because the amount of adrenaline coursing through your body, I bet, at this point, is through the roof. Like we said, we can't imagine the panic that would make you feel to know that your nephew, keep in mind, you guys, this is her nephew and his wife, who is your best friend, are fighting the evening before, and then you receive this call, oh, it would be so bone chilling. A maintenance man had just happened to spot the purse very early in the morning of January 7th in the dumpster, and maybe finding a discarded purse doesn't seem that strange, because... Yeah, I could understand why it would raise alarms a little bit. But in my first thought, if I saw a purse in a hotel dumpster, I would think, oh, maybe someone got mugged. Because generally, Mm, they're going to take all of the credit cards, you know, take the stuff they want, the valuables out of it. And then what do they need from the purse unless you're walking around with a Louis Vuitton and they have some like resale value? If it's just your (laughs) average like Target purse, they're just going to get rid of that evidence. You don't want to be caught with that. But Here's where things get a little strange. Upon further inspection, they found that her ID, wallet, keys, credit cards, and sadly, the more than $1,000 of cash that she had stowed away was still in that purse. So clearly, if they are robbing her, they're taking all the good stuff. They're taking the money, probably the ID, any kind of credit card she had. But in this case, they just dumped a fully loaded purse. Does not make sense. It doesn't. So immediately the police are suspecting foul play. When Yvonne and Bernie arrived at the hotel, Michael and his father were already there. I assume the police had called Michael first, right? This is her husband after all. And so Yvonne got there second. And they wanted to know a little bit more about his wife's whereabouts. Michael seemed shocked when the police showed him that in front of his family, the amount of cash that was in her purse And so, like I said, she had done a pretty good job of of hiding that money away because, let's just say, he had no idea why she had that amount of money. The police obviously knew there wasn't a purse discarded after a robbery. They were immediately suspicious that Bonnie had been met with foul play. So they went ahead and had all the dumpsters in the surrounding areas checked immediately. Unfortunately, at this time, they're suspecting if this was discarded, could Bonnie herself have been discarded in a nearby dumpster. Thankfully, there was no body found in any of the dumpsters, but they also couldn't locate Bonnie's car. It wasn't at the Red Roof Inn, and there was no reservation at that inn under her name. The police told Michael to return home, which to me sounded a bit odd. Like, don't you want to do follow-up interviews with him? I hate to say it, but we know sometimes when people go missing or they're killed, it's usually someone they know and someone close to them. So you would think they'd want to keep Michael close to them. But then you got to think he has a young son. They have no evidence at this point, a reason to suspect him. And I wonder if Michael was able to charm Bonnie's parents so easily. He obviously charmed Bonnie. I wonder if he was kind of just charming to the police. Like he seemed like the husband who maybe got left by his wife. And maybe he was kind of playing that victim, which eased the cops' minds. And they were like, yeah, go home. But. Also, to your point, Aaron, who's at home or wherever he is. I mean, he's, what, three at this point? 
a little over three years old. And you're right. But also we need to take into consideration this was a time when kidnappings and stuff were still getting ransom calls. This was happening a lot more than it happens now. So they wanted Michael to return home and be waiting for a call to come in. If Bonnie had been abducted, they needed to make sure there's someone home to answer that follow-up call. But really, no one knew what the hell was going on. Later that day, Detective Robbie Henson, who we love in this case. Robbie's the good guy? Very good guy. He was assigned to Bonnie's missing persons case, and he returned to the inn to interview guests and security guards. But all the leads they received from them unfortunately led to absolutely nothing. Since the inn was so close to the airport, he decided to check their parking lots for Bonnie's car. In an interview with Dateline, he said, it was a logical place to hide a car, which gave me a moment of pause because I was thinking, well, why? And then it dawned on me. And it probably took a second because I'm not in the business of hiding people's cars that have gone missing. But a car being (laughs) in an airport does quite a few things. Now, if you're a bad person and you're listening to this, I'm not giving you tips of where to hide the car. But let's just look at it from Robbie Hansen's point of view. Depending on the size of the airport, it's going to take forever to go through every row of parking to check license plates. Even if you find the make and model of the car, you still have to determine it's the correct car. And imagine going through the Denver airport and not only all of their like short-term and long-term parking lots, but then the surrounding parking lots of the airport that you have to shuttle into. Girl, I lose my own car there and I have a picture of the exact row. Like E32 is my spot and I still will wander around that airport forever. So yes, good spot to drop a car. No, we're not recommending it, but I can see why, you know, whoever did this did it. Absolutely. The second thing is it could give the illusion that the person that they're looking for was getting on a flight. Maybe this young mom was sick of Michael. She was over it. Maybe she met a hot new pool boy suitor of some sort, and she's off to give up motherhood and all of her responsibilities. She's thinking in her head, you know, I didn't get to go to college, married at 18 to this asshole, Michael, and I'm sick of it, and I'm going to go live the rest of my life in Mexico. Seems a little far-fetched, but they at least have to look into this possibility. But the other thing to consider here is it would be, even prior to 9-11, it would not be very easy to get on a plane without an ID, credit cards, cash, anything to buy the plane ticket. I was just thinking that you need your ID to get anywhere. But also, she seemed like an amazing mother. I don't think she'd leave Aaron. But putting aside like that empathy... The money in her purse, her ID, any kind of credit card. It's a no for me, dog. This woman did not run away. Yeah, you and Randy Jackson are both saying uh, no. Mm -mm. Well, Detective Jensen scoured the parking lot, and he was correct. He found Bonnie's Toyota Camry. He checked on all of the outgoing flight manifests, but as we suspected, Bonnie had not gotten onto a flight. She had not even purchased a flight. Bonnie's car was combed through by the crime scene analysis team, and they noticed something a bit odd. Annie, I'm going to send this picture over of what they found in her car. The first thing they noticed is that Bonnie was a little on the shorter side, and her driver's side seat seemed to be pushed back to just to someone of a much taller height. However, is that actually evidence? I don't know. Some people drive like they are like halfway laying down. I'm not going to really take that into too much evidence because they did show that while maybe it was pushed back for someone of a different size, she still would have been able to reach the pedal. So mm, not really strong evidence. But what is interesting is keep in mind where we are. Yes, it's wintertime, but we're in Florida. Florida doesn't really have winter as we know it up here in Colorado. And there was a very noticeable sandy shoe print. Shoe prints that clearly, I mean, Annie, you're not a detective, but would you think that shoe print belonged to a woman? No, it looks like a huge shoe print. And when I tell you, this looks like he stepped in almost paint. Like that's how defined it is. You can see the tracks. You can see the the, the width, almost the full length of the shoe. I'm kind of also like, he didn't notice that or whoever. I mean, I can say he because you can tell it's a male shoe. That's so obvious. It is obvious. But the other thing it makes me think of is if you look closely at this picture, this is either sand or like 
very fine dirt. Yeah. It would be very hard. Let's say it was Michael. He got in the car. You know, I'm not married, but to my future husband out there, you are in charge of car duties. I don't understand anything about that. So it wouldn't <laughs> seem weird to me that I'd be like, hey, um, hubby, can you go get the oil changed or like my tires looking low? And they might, you know, adjust the seat, get in and out. However, when that dirt is so fine, it's going to be shuffled around very easily. I feel like you could take that picture almost and blow on it and the shoe print would go away. And so it seemed to detectives that this was made very, very recently. So whether someone had access to her car, whether it was her husband that had access to the car and rightfully so as her husband, it had just been put there. As we know, most of the time when people go missing or are killed, they know their killer, unfortunately. And so police had to do what they do for any investigation. They needed to look into her husband's whereabouts. Michael said that Bonnie and him had a disagreement. He was very upfront about that. And then he said she left the family home around 11 p.m. that evening. And at 3 a.m., he went to look for her, even driving past her mother's house to check for her vehicle before returning home when he didn't find her. I want you to remember this timeline of his whereabouts he gave, because in every interview that I listened to, that I watched, all the articles I read, Michael leaves out something that really stood out to me, and that's his son, Aaron. I was literally like, where's the boy? Like, where is he? He's so little. He needs his... He needs someone looking out for him. Yeah, you would think that any reasonable person, let's say you get in a fight with your wife. You're going out to look for her. You're not leaving your three-year-old child at home in the middle of the night. So was Aaron with him searching for his mom? As far as I could find, like I said, he never makes mention of his son. And I'm just going to plant that seed in your brain because we'll be circling back to that shortly. Remember that shoe print, though? Funny enough, I bet you can't guess what the police found right when they walked into Michael's house. A pair of shoes that fit the bill. When investigators went into Michael's home, they found quite quickly, right out in the open, a size 10 sneaker not only matching the size of the imprint, but the exact tread that was left in Bonnie's car. Is, again, is that evidence? We'll see. I want it to be. I want it to be evidence because I, Michael's looking like the suspect, but also to your point, that's his car too, kind of. Yeah, what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. Detectives did test the home for blood with luminol for those that aren't familiar with it. Basically, it's a chemical that reacts with blood, even blood that's been cleaned up to a certain degree, and it will glow when you turn a black light on. So they were spritz, spritz, spritz in Windex and all over his house with this luminol and found nothing. They also checked the area surrounding his home. Nothing. I hate to pass judgment on how someone acts in the midst of grief of a crisis because everyone handles things differently. While I've never been through this situation, I will be honest, I've been through some quite painful and scary situations and I instantly go into fix-it mode. I want to make a plan. I want to busy myself with tasks. For me, that's my way of holding off emotion until I can process it privately. And I'll even admit, it's something I'm working on. We are in growth process over here at Case of the Sunday Scaries, or at least I am. I have made and been known to make some kind of inappropriate jokes, um, not at anyone's expense, but more so just trying to lighten the mood in the room when things are tense. And then I later go, why the hell did I say that? You're such a Leo. Is that a, a trait? <laughs> like you have that Leo? Leo energy maxed out. <laughs> is that a Leo trait? Yes. One of my really good friends is a Leo and she does the exact same thing. I'm a cancer. I will cuddle up in bed and like openly cry if I'm just upset. But those Leos, you got that tiger behind you or that lion. I, I just, love it. I need to go into action. I certainly can shed a tear over a homework commercial with my friends. But if something truly like catastrophic happens, I'm someone that wants to hold that in until I'm by myself or maybe with a therapist. We love a little mental health check-in at this podcast, but it's just not something that I'm comfortable expressing with a big group of people. Um, So I would imagine that if, God forbid, I was in a situation like this, I probably would not be perceived as someone who is going through the expected quote-unquote grief process or worried or I I wouldn't be projecting what people would anticipate I would be projecting. 
because I would be like, let's let's just say, God forbid, someone in my life goes missing. I would be the person generally probably stone cold on those news interviews being like, this is what we need. Bring back so-and-so. I would be very matter of fact. And the minute Mike was turned away, I would be a, you know, a puddle of tears. So I can kind of sympathize that sometimes you're not going to look from the outside how people think you should look during these times. We've all passed judgment. We've watched these like news interviews. Someone goes up and we're like, ooh, they look suspicious. They're not acting how we want to act. I think that's human nature to do that, but it can't always be trusted. Of course, sometimes, um, <clears throat> Chris Watts, it certainly can be. The husbands always, whenever they're doing their little spiels, I'm curious to hear how Michael's acting because I feel like the husbands are always uh, stone cold, begging for the public, saying, you know, your daughters need you, your kids need you. But if that was going to be you, Elise, like I wouldn't want anyone judging you for what you say. So how is Michael acting? Is he a cancer or is he a Leo? <laughs> he was neither. He kind of seemed passive, if not dismissive. And not only did the police take note of this, but the public did as well. He did the customary appeal, family appeal, that if someone knows where she is, etc. But if you could describe monotone as a person, its name would be Michael. He was sort of just talking like this. And while that's not evidence, it certainly seemed a little suspicious. Like he sounded like Eeyore during the whole thing. Mm. So while we're not wanting to judge anyone and how they react, you can't pass judgment on how you would react in this situation because unless you've been through it, first of all, you don't know how you'd react. But it added to the growing list of suspicion around Michael. Let's go back to that son, though. Would he potentially know anything? He is only around three and a half at this time. But my God, Annie, while I was researching this case, I realized the one thing we are missing in this podcast studio, except you, I wish you were here right now, is a box <laughs> of tissues. Because this next part, ooh, it got the waterworks going. He was interviewed by a social worker and he had an absolutely chilling story to tell. A few female family members sat in the room to make Aaron feel more comfortable with the social workers. And she began talking to Aaron, casual conversation with a three and a half year old. You know, do you want a color? What are your favorite games? What do you like to do? And then she even offered him a little happy meal. But according to her interview with Dateline, things started to get more serious as Aaron got more comfortable. Annie, this is heartbreaking. But when he asked about his mommy, Aaron told the social worker that his dad had shot her. In follow-up oh questions, gosh. this little three-and-a-half-year-old boy tells the social worker that his daddy shot his mommy with a gun in her belly. Such a vivid description for a three-year-old. Well, as if that wasn't enough, the social worker asked him what was mommy wearing. I suspect that she asked this because she wants to know, okay, if there is a body, or if she is a missing person, whatever the case, we need to know what she was last wearing so we can help identify her if she is found. <sighs> Big deep breath. Because Aaron leaned over and very quietly whispered, Red blood. That is a dagger to my heart, like this poor traumatized three-year-old. And what an answer. Not she had a sweater and it had, you know, blood on it. His answer was red blood. That's what she was wearing. That's his description of it. That sounds like a very messy, whatever happened, it was messy and there was a lot of blood. That's a gunshot horrible. wound to the stomach area would certainly do that. Now, I heard this and I was like, oh, done. Open and shut case. But then you have to realize he is only three and a half years old. This is not going to really stand up in court because kids are so impressionable. He could be filling in the holes with his imagination. He could have overheard something. And unfortunately, at this time, children's interviews did not have to be recorded like they are now. So it was this social worker and the women in the room's word against Michael. Who probably already had their suspicions about Michael. So it would be easy for them to be like, hey, Aaron said this about you. And the other thing I'm thinking of is, could Aaron have been fed? this story like okay we're gonna go in there and you're gonna get a happy meal 
and you're going to say this. Okay. Can you do that for me, buddy? Like I'm just, and I'm, I'm sure that's not what happened, but I'm picturing everything that a defense attorney could say, like, it's a three-year-old. Come on, people. Playing devil's advocate. Yeah. And to your first point, Annie, it didn't go exactly like you would expect because remember how much Bonnie's parents liked Michael? Bonnie's mom was in and out of this room during the time. And the social worker, why we don't have a record of this to go against what she's saying. Um, I was listening to her interview. She seemed incredibly believable, even though I said, don't pass judgment on how someone's coming off. This was an interview done years later, and she was incredibly emotional reliving this. And she said that Bonnie's mom was not in the room during the entire time. Bon was. But it seemed like Bonnie's parents were standing by Michael. What this interview did do was convince other members of the family that Michael was involved and that they needed to protect Aaron at all costs. Because what's to say, like you said, that Bonnie's mom, who is on Michael's side, doesn't go back and go, you wouldn't believe the crap Aaron just said. And it sounded like Aaron was the only witness to this horrendous traumatic moment if it did happen this way, and he is speaking out about it. The state removed Aaron from his home to stay with his aunt, but Aaron would react violently every time his dad came over for their supervised visit, which were twice a week. The next step was sadly, or I don't know, I guess happily, depending on how you look at it, for Aaron's safety, I will say happily, he was put into a foster home so that his dad would not have access to him. In order to do so, Bonnie's family had to petition the court to make Aaron a protected witness, which effectively immediately removed Michael of all his parental rights. But let's pause here and get back to the case. The only real physical evidence they have is the shoe print matching the one that Michael owned. But he's also the husband, like we said. I'm going to have my husband in my car quite a bit because I don't know crap about cars. Oh. <laughs> oh, hey. <laughs> in the front seat, Annie. Get your mind out of the gutter. <laughs> but then also with this case, you have that classic phrase, no body, no crime. And we all know cliches are cliches for a reason. It's because they're generally true. Everything they had against Michael was suspicious, but circumstantial. It was not forensic proof, and they certainly didn't think the testimony of a three-year-old would stand up in court. He could have overheard police or family members discussing the case, maybe even just seen a violent movie and filled in the gaps for himself. And they also, and really importantly, did not have an established crime scene. So, with all of that stacked against them, no blood, no body, no real evidence of a crime happening at the home, the case went cold. And here's where I almost stopped thinking I was going to report on this because I hate a cold case. I want answers. You almost passed it over to me. <laughs> I certainly did. I was about to text you like, oh, I got a case that's really interesting. But here's where things take a turn. Let's go back to Aaron for a second. Because little Aaron is now in his foster parents, the Frasers' home, and they seem like salt of the earth people. I cannot underline that, add enough exclamations. Like they just seem absolutely incredible. They provided Aaron with such a loving home where his father would never be able to reach him. And in an interview with Dateline, his foster mother said that as Aaron got more comfortable around them, he would open up more and more. I want you to listen to the memory this little boy had that he gave to his foster mother, Jean. She even said in this interview that he would talk so much and ask her to like write it down. I want you to write it down because he would have meetings with his psychologist. So he's young. We're talking five or six at this time. It's been some time. He's gotten comfortable with them. And so she is writing down all of these horrible memories that he's having. But I want to point out one in particular because Jean did dictate what he had said to read to the social worker assigned to his case. His psychologist, thankfully, filmed this interview. But I'm going to read it to you now. My dad killed my mommy. Then he threw the pocketbook away somewhere near my house in a dumpster. He buried my mom. We digged it. The hole. What's the one word in that that stands out? We. Are you kidding? That made me sick to my stomach that not only potentially now do we have this boy witnessing the death of his mother, but becoming an active participant in it at less than four years old. Way to really try and mess up someone's life. I mean, thank God he had amazing foster parents because like the 
just the thought of that as a, as an adult terrifies me. But as a little kid who can't quite function what's going on and where his mommy is and how he helped dig the hole, supposedly, right? I hate Michael. And I love Bonnie. And Aaron seems so sweet. Well, innocent until proven guilty. We, you know, Michael's suspicious, but we don't know yet. True, true. This is one of many statements he made about Michael killing Bonnie. He even said to Jean, his foster mom, can we go look for my mama? She agreed. And this happened quite often. But one time in particular, she went to get in the car and Aaron turned to run into the backyard. She asked Aaron, where are you going? And his answer? to get a shovel. Goosebumps. I'm covered. It's awful. Aaron also would reach out to Detective Hansen, who was still working on this case, but was so connected to it that he and Aaron formed quite a bond. And anytime Aaron wanted to, he would take Aaron to go look for his mom. Unfortunately, little Aaron could never remember quite where she was. Aaron's foster parents, Ronnie and Jean Frazier, ended up adopting Aaron after he had been living with them for six years, and they filed a civil suit on behalf of Aaron for the wrongful death of his mother, Bonnie. And not only did they win, they won $26 million because Michael couldn't be bothered to show up in court to even contest the suit. So he has no time in his life, I guess, to say, no, I didn't kill her and I'm going to make sure to defend myself. Even if this isn't a criminal case, I'm going to defend myself in civil court. Nope, couldn't be bothered to show up. It's such a slap in the face. Yeah, that's crazy. Michael was not a millionaire. He did not have $26 million laying around. I think a lot of it was just, I mean, if you think back to like the OJ case, remember they ended up winning against OJ in civil and it kind of was like, oh, this is some level of vindication since the criminal case was, oh, we won't go too far into that. No, the, we both, we're thinking the same thing. Yeah. The criminal case um, against Michael, they didn't have enough evidence. So this was their way of not only getting a little bit of justice, but while Michael wasn't a multimillionaire, he did still have and own the family home that Aaron had spent his first few years on earth living in. He also had some shares of the construction supply store that his parents had worked for. And at age 16, all of those were deeded over to Aaron. But let's be honest, Aaron wasn't in a rush to return to live at the property where he grew up and where, potentially, he witnessed his mother's murder. Aaron went on to live a relatively normal life, quote unquote, because what is normal? He graduated and got married, but how does a boy so traumatized for years over what he said was the murder of his mom in front of him and even helping his dad bury her live a normal life? As Aaron grew up in his teens and young adult years, he has no memory of his mom, Bonnie, or his biological father. I'm going to call him sperm donor Michael because that's about all I'm going to give him credit for. Nor did he remember ever saying any of this stuff to his foster parents or the social workers so it begs the question did he make it all up was he brainwashed like bonnie's parents originally thought turns out it's not so simple and that is where i want to pause from the case and go down my psychology rabbit hole i'm excited for this whenever we first met you talked about how much you enjoyed the human mind when it comes to true crime so i am ready for what you have for us Well, and it's interesting in this case to not be trying to figure out the psyche, which I will hopefully never be able to relate to or understand the psyche of a killer. But this time we're going to look into Aaron's a little bit. I read a lot of articles about regressed memories or disassociative amnesia, as it's often referred to, especially when it surrounds childhood trauma. And I think choosingtherapy.com article that I will make sure to put in our show notes for today because... This article was very eye-opening. It really kind of summed it up perfectly. It states that most experts view disassociative amnesia as a defense mechanism one may use to block out painful past memories. Most of the time, repressing a trauma memory is an involuntary response and not a conscious decision someone makes. Because children don't have the ability to prevent traumatic events like sexual, physical, or emotional abuse, disassociating can be their only way of coping with such trauma. That is heartbreaking to me. Right. Because you, I mean, if you're a kid, you don't have the 
mental bandwidth, the physical strength to outmaneuver these people that are doing these awful things to you or that you're witnessing. Repressed memories can often be recovered when a person encounters something that reminds them of a traumatic event, such as familiar sights, sounds, or as many of us know, scent is really connected to memories. So oftentimes, even just a smell that is associated with that trauma can bring what they call a flood back. Now, I'm not talking about Noah's Ark flood. I'm talking about when a person feels flooded by the memory, even if they can't recall that memory, they might be flooded by the feelings associated around it. Being flooded by a traumatic memory can cause someone to experience feelings of reliving the experience, high levels of anxiety or sudden panic attacks, a strong urge to escape or avoid the trigger so your fight or flight is absolutely put into like high alert. Flashbacks or uncontrollable memories that replay in the mind, which I can't even imagine. And then also, like they don't know why, but you would have this overwhelming feeling of strong negative emotions like disgust, anger, shame, or grief when something triggers that memory. Again, the memory itself doesn't always have to come back for any of these things to be happening. Although this is a coping mechanism for the child, it is so sad how repressed memories even ones that are never recalled can often lead to trouble for people as they get older if they're not worked through with proper support and help. It sounded like Aaron had a really great foster parents that surrounded him that actually became his, you know, adoptive parents. There was also a social worker that worked on his case for quite some time. But I would really encourage you guys to read more about this. Like I said, I will put this synopsis that was on choosingtherapy.com in the show notes because while maybe this isn't something that you've experienced, the more knowledgeable we are surrounding mental health matters, the more empathetic and understanding we can be towards others. Could not have said it better myself. I also just can't help but think if you don't know why you're feeling like this, like Aaron had suppressed those memories. He's probably thinking, why do I feel so angry all of a sudden? Because just out of curiosity, did his foster parents ever talk to him as an adult about what happened? From what I could see, it seemed like he was aware and he certainly would become aware soon. But he was aware of these things. But in an interview he did with Dateline, I'm not sure the time frame that he made reference to this, but he said it just kind of felt like an out of body, like I was watching or listening to a book about somebody else or a movie about somebody else. I didn't have anything I could personally connect to it, even seeing the interview of himself talking with the social worker. It just seemed like, "Mm, I see that that's me. I understand the facts that that's me but I don't have any feelings attached to it. That would be so confusing. Right. Yeah, you never know what is the cause of all of these feelings and triggers. Now, I want to get back to the case because thankfully this story didn't end where I left off. Otherwise, Annie would be covering it. Two decades after (laughs) Bonnie went missing, in 2014, Aaron returned to his childhood home. He had been using it as a rental property But as is the case with a lot of rental properties, once the renters move out, it was time to gussy it up a bit and do some repairs. I know all about that right now because I am, let's just say I've been getting elbow deep in some home repairs recently. Let's just say you've been gussying it up. I love that verb. (laughs) Like how fun (laughs) of a word. Just gussying it up. (laughs) Sometimes I think I was born in a different like century or something with some of the phrases. I'm like, I've never used that. Maybe that's my repressed memories. (laughs) Maybe I'm from the 1800s. Like, what adult woman nowadays says whoopsie daisy and gussying it up and all that stuff? (laughs) Maybe I had another life in the 20s. The outdoor pool and outdoor shower needed to be completely redone, which obviously would cost a lot of money. Aaron and his brother in law decided to do as much as they could around the house and do these renovations on their own. They decided to fill in the pool instead of putting in a new one and remove the outdoor shower. The two boys rented an excavator, and they got to work. But if you have done your own DIY at a house, you know that you go to fix one thing, and then you find out it's 24 other things you need to fix. Or, as is the case with many of the home renovations I've been doing lately, you find out it's a much bigger project than you originally anticipated. And unfortunately, the inexperienced brother-in-law crew broke a pipe near the outdoor shower and needed to figure out where the leak was in this pipe. 
So Aaron started digging near the house and very soon after discovered a plastic wrapping just under the ground. He mentioned in an interview with Dateline that his shovel broke through the plastic bag and he saw what he thought was a coconut, wondering to himself, well, that's weird. Why would someone bury a coconut in a bag right outside? Aaron handed it to his brother-in-law and looked deeper into the hole he was digging. That's where he was met with, pun intended, a bone-chilling sight because he could make out human teeth and the eye socket of the rest of the skull. Yes, that coconut that he found was the top portion of a human skull. I cannot imagine going to fix a pipe and finding a skeleton. And keeping in mind that he doesn't really remember what happened. So to him, I I bet immediately he didn't think like, this is my mother's body, right? He's probably just thinking, this is really odd. Like, Maybe he was thinking the renters were some Jeffrey Dahmer people who were just burying people everywhere. John Wayne Gacy, you know, I'm curious, like, what was going through his mind at that point? Well, let's remember what I just talked about with regressed memories, that sometimes triggers can bring back floods of emotions, of feelings, and sometimes even memories, because it seemingly all clicked for him. He realized that this was probably his mother. He called his adoptive mother, Jean, who was in church at the time. She saw his call and called back. And when he answered, he asked for Detective Hansen's phone number. When she asked why, he said, I found her. I found my mother. Detective Hansen raced to the house, and it was very quickly determined that, yes, this was human remains of a female body. Detective Hansen, who has been so close to Aaron in this case, Oh, his interview was heartbreaking. He got really choked up talking about it, even to this day, because he felt an incredible guilt for, as he put it, missing her. And I get it. This case had become personal to him. He got close with Aaron. He got close with the Frasers. And I want to show you how this was missed. So, Annie, there's a picture that I sent you a little earlier today. And you'll notice that the first picture looks like a yard. Nothing seems to be really disturbed, but there is a, I don't know what you would call it, like a few boards. What are those called? Mm -hmm. Everyone was making furniture out of them for a while. Perfect. Yes. There's a wooden pallet and then there's all sorts of chemicals on top of it, right? You see that? Yeah, that's odd to me. But the yard doesn't look messed up or anything. It just, the chemicals are like, are they cleaning agents? Are they used to clean up something like a body? Right, except remember where we are. We're in Florida, and this is all chemicals that would be needed for a pool, an outdoor shower. Oh, yeah, yeah. I totally forgot about that. Because this is like right by the pool shed, isn't it? Is that what that shed is or the shower? Mm Mm-hmm. Got it. Okay, so that would make sense then. Like they should probably be out there. Yeah. Not only that, if you have a three-year-old running around, those are not chemicals that you are probably going to be keeping inside your house. You don't want your kid playing with non-diluted chlorine. Right. Well, it just doesn't look like a disturbed burial site. I just feel bad that Detective Hansen is carrying this guilt, like, oh, I I should have realized that. I think that this is something that easily could have been looked over. Maybe if the ground around it had been disturbed, if the grass wasn't seemingly put back right into place. It would be a little bit more noticeable, but to someone who's used to having pool chemicals outside, maybe Mr. Hansen has a pool of his own, this would seem pretty normal. Of course, four months later, it was confirmed that the remains were that of Bonnie Haim. They could not determine a cause of death because the body was just skeletal remains at this point. Again, you guys, this is 20 plus years. But along with the body, in that plastic wrapping, they found the shell casing of a 22 caliber bullet. Michael owned a gun of that same caliber. Michael Hamm was arrested in August of 2015. He was living down in North Carolina at the time. He had remarried. He was just onward and upward with his life until the detectives knocked at his door. And I watched his testimony during his trial. I'm not going to give this piece of crap man the attention he maybe wants by telling you all the nonsense he spewed about it. But if you're interested, you can find it on YouTube. I will just say it's interesting because I talked earlier in this case about not judging someone by their reactions, but he is a classic example of you also can't judge a person by how they look because he is clean cut. He looks like he looks like just anybody. He's like he's attractive. I'll say it. I mean, I, I don't like this man, but he has a nice mustache, like great head of hair. I can see what the the 
charm about him is, which just makes it worse because I feel like I always have this idea of what a killer looks like. And it's not Michael. No, they don't generally look like the boogeyman, you know, of your nightmares. These are just humans. So they look like just humans. And Michael certainly did that. A very well-dressed one, I will say. But Michael was found guilty. And we often discuss, Annie, how crimes like this have a ripple effect throughout the family, throughout the community. And with that in mind, I want to read to you Aaron's statement prior to sentencing of his biological sperm donor crap of a father, according to a Jacksonville.com article by Aileen Kelly. He said he has no memory of what happened when he was three. He told the judge he had been dealing with depression and suicidal thoughts, though, since he was 16. Some days are worse than others, Frazier said. When things get really bad, sometimes it just seemed easier to give up. He went on to explain that when his life got turbulent, he had this burning desire to resolve where his mother was buried. He said when he was 18, he drove down a dirt road on the banks of the Nassau River. He had a shovel with him. I was looking for my mom, he said. I found myself as lost as I had ever been. I might not have been lost physically, but I was depressed and suicidal. And I want to pause really quick and point out that he said when things got really bad or turbulent in his life, that's when he would have, like we talked about earlier when we were learning about regressed memories, this overwhelming desire to go look for this mom that at this point he didn't even remember her, but something inside of him did, right? Frazier told Whittington, uh, who was the judge for this trial, that he did not know what a fair sentence would be, but he wanted the judge to understand this. Every day that Michael Hayne was a free man, I lived in fear that he may come for me. I was the one person on the planet that had knowledge of what he had done and could stand in the way of his liberty. I would ask that Michael get a sentence that would ensure that I do not have to be concerned about ever running into him again. Most importantly, I do not want to ever have to worry about him doing harm to me or to any member of my family. I want everyone to be safe from him, and the only way to achieve this is for him to spend the rest of his life in prison. And the judge agreed, because on on May 21st, 2019, 26 years after Bonnie's murder, Michael Hayne was sentenced to life in prison. It's so tragic to me that this young boy had to witness all of this brutality and I think once the body was recovered it became wildly clear to everyone hopefully Bonnie's parents as well that his recollection all that many years ago of his dad shooting his mom and then him help bury her just feet outside of their back door is obviously quite accurate to what happened and what I found even more interesting in this case when I removed myself from just the tragedy of what happened to poor Bonnie, was it's astounding that our psyche and brain can do so much in order to try to protect us from trauma. Clearly, the trauma is still present. I think Aaron's words during sentencing only confirms that. But it was fascinating to me that undoubtedly, one of and hopefully the most traumatic thing that Aaron will ever witness in his life, his brain pushed it aside, packed it away, so that he could replace it with happier memories of his adoptive parents and fishing and playing sports, meeting his wife, who he later went on to marry, that seemingly those feelings only surfaced when things were rocky in his life. It's just wild to me. The human brain is wild. And the different trauma responses that people have. Yes. And for the first time, I'm speechless. All I can say is I hope that Aaron has found some kind of peace. Because what a life to go through these ups and downs and emotions that you can't explain, then to find the skeletal remains of your mother, then to go through trial and face your sperm donor. Like, oh, I hope that he's living a really happy life right now. Well, and seemingly from his interviews, he is. But, you know, like you said, there's just so many points of trauma here and and pain that he had to deal with and having, you know, suicidal thoughts that he couldn't even explain the the why behind those thoughts. It's It's heartbreaking and it's also very fascinating. I'm thankful that Aaron is here on this planet with us today, that he didn't give in to those thoughts and that, you know, thankfully, maybe by finding his mother's body, that gives him permission to have some closure and resolution to this and that his, you know, shithole of a dad will be behind bars and not, you know, someone that could potentially harm him or his family ever again. 
But with that said, let us know what you think about this case. Do you have any experience with regressed memories? Don't comment that because it's probably something pretty private to you. But share your thoughts because this was a case that, um, like I said, it's just interesting not only to get into the psychology of of the why behind people's atrocious acts, but this case, it's almost getting an understanding of what happens to the victim because let's make it very clear, Aaron is a victim. So while Bonnie might have gotten justice in some degree and it took years to do it, Aaron is going to have to deal with this for the rest of his life. So with that said, thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, it helps us when you subscribe, hit the follow button and share with your friends. We have been seeing some uh, Spotify top little listens or whatever coming in. And it's so exciting to see that. Yeah. Annie and I have been sending them back and forth when a friend or one of our followers sends it to us that they have taken the time to listen to so many episodes. And truly, you guys, it means the world to us. So as always, we'll be back next week, hopefully, hopefully with a video in an all new case. But as always, until then.